starting as a dancer at 17, professionally, to 47. It's a long career, but we all started at a very uh, young age training for this career. Not all of us are, are as fortunate, but most of us are a little oblivious to what is possible when you go in to take your first ballet class. When you go in and take your ballet class, your parents call you a ballerina because you're in ballet. But that word is, is a very special word, and it takes a lot of uh, time and energy and effort and luck to be able to achieve what that word means. So it's been a long time since I dove into being a dancer. I've been here since 2010 as uh, the artistic director, and I retired in 2007. So I've been out of talking about me and looking at me as a dancer and, and promoting myself and or being promoted so that I can uh, spread the word for the organization that I was working for. So now I do that for my dancers and for this organization. So it's funny to dive back in there. Um, it's like riding a bike. <laughs> and they said, what, do you, what are you going to talk about? I'm like, oh, I'm going to talk about the company and talk about what we did, what we've done, how far we've come since, since, uh, since I got here, and my incredible dancers. And Michael says, why don't you talk about something you know a little bit better, and that's you. So I'm going to talk about me a little bit and how I got here. Let's look at you first. Oh, let's look at me well, first so you kind of understand who I am and what well, I did for a living. It's a work that's called On the Front Porch of Heaven. That's me. That's what I did every day to earn a living. Thank you. I can't believe I used to darn white unitards just for walking around and dancing in front of 3,000 people and thought nothing of it. Now I'm like, oh my god, I looked pretty good back then. <laughs> Thank goodness for downlighting creates lovely shadows, which I've asked for for today, too. Oh. Um, my early years. Uh, I'm from rural America. I'm from Eastern Washington, uh, Richland, Washington, to be exact, which is the area that was part of the three areas that created the nuclear bomb. Uh, we created the, we produced plutonium for it, and it's called Hamford, is the area. So, dancing and being a, a ballet dancer around the world kind of is a far fetch from going and taking ballet class. I started ballet at seven. My um, I have eight siblings. Uh, I'm the eight. So I am the eighth of nine. My parents really believed in something that each of us could do. None of us really needed friends. We had each other, and so we were like a, a club or a mob at some point in time. And we were the you know the the strong team on the block because we could vote all as one, and we had nine votes, and so which was fantastic. But as we as each of us went in and went to school, and um, you were always one of Kurt's kids. That was my father, Curtis Robert Barker. We were one of Kurt's kids. Oh, you're a Barker. They could tell by what we looked like, the way we stood, the way we talked, or the way we didn't talk. And so we needed an identity. Uh, no one had gone into ballet by the time they got to the eighth child. So my father met a ballet teacher fresh off the boat from France and said, I have a seven-year-old. 
she said she'd be perfect for ballet. And to dance I went. I was very fortunate that was a great fit because in dance I didn't have to talk either, uh, which I've overcome a little bit of that to, uh, now, uh, which I'm doing. My, um, my dad let us do anything we wanted. You could do anything as you wanted as long as your bike could get you there, is what he would say. Oh, I'd like to go to the mall. Does your bike get you there? I'd like to do this. I'd like to go ice skating. And does your bike get you there? So not only did your bike get you everywhere you went, you learned not to go too far or be ready to work very hard to get there. So if you really wanted something, which I wanted to go to ballet, I'd ride my bike. And, it was, and I had a hill to ride up coming home, which wasn't always fun. I had, to I had to take piano lessons. Those were the rules, every single one of us. My mother played the organ, the piano, any instrument she could pick up and play. So into piano, all of us went. Well, you rode your bike past the country club that had the swimming pool at it. So sh I went swimming instead of going to piano, and I would rip up the checks. and. She, my mother thought the woman was so kind that maybe by the eighth child, she was just now letting them come and take piano lessons until she saw her one day and discussed it in the grocery store, and then I got in trouble. Uh, and, but then I started getting a ride to piano lessons, which was kind of cool. So there was a, I learned diplomacy early on with eight children how to get your way, because you have to, especially when you're one of the little ones, so you don't get locked in the, in the trunk of a car while they're babysitting you or anything like that. So, oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as I said, my husband's helpful sometimes. Um, this is seven years old, uh, my first uh, performance. And I'm even on point, which I don't think I was supposed to be. I think I found them in the back room and got on to point. Because you want to make sure that the legs and feet are all ready. As you see, my kneecaps are a little bigger than any other part on my body. And so as we grow up, we, we, <laughs> we grow tall. Um, but the determination I think you can see on my face, especially in this one, and dance was my refuge. It was where I went. Where I was not uh, good in school. I didn't like school. I didn't like anything to do with it. I have dyslexia, and uh, at that point in time, they thought phonetics was a great way to learn, and it's not. Uh, sounding out a word, especially when you don't know which way the letters go, or that why are there so many fives and threes in a word. So that kind of took away things for me. But dance was, was exactly, it was pattering, and that that's what I did well. well. As soon as my father figured that out, he thought uh, typing lessons would be great because of my memorization, which I think helped immensely. So having clever parents uh, and being the eight, they kind of learn things by the time you get there and they can help you out. My uh, father always said, uh, I'm the only artist in the company. We have a nuclear scientist, we have a lawyer, we have school teachers, we have business owners, um, accountants, all sorts of things, and I'm the only working artist. He said, uh, you're the apple that dropped and rolled far away from the tree. Oh. Um, that was a good thing. It was, it was a good thing. It was a good thing for me, and it was a, a, a great thing uh, for my husband, too, because otherwise I wouldn't have met him. He, too, was a classical ballet dancer. But the best thing about ballet class when I was young is that, and I thought it should be this way up until my professional careers, is that we had a half an hour bar, which is a training, and an 15-minute ice cream break, woohoo! And then, you know, into a little bit of stuff in the center. My teacher was always the star of all of our productions, and she, we were always some type of bird. So other than that, and so I talk about fantasy. I get ice cream in the middle of working hard. I get to be a, a, a bird of any sort, which people aren't birds, uh, but we got to play on point shoes and dance and wear tiaras and tutus. Nothing like a tiara to, to, to create an incredible fantasy. So uh, dance camps, I went to Boston Ballet School. I came back to Seattle and uh, was on a full scholarship at Pacific Northwest Ballet. I was the first student at PMB to be on a full scholarship. And that's kind of when I started realizing, when I started auditioning for dance camps, I grew a little too tall, I was a little too thin, I looked a little bit like a stork, I had straight legs. I have hyperextension, which is the legs that go backward, which I think you can kind of see a little way. bit. And backwards stand and sideways. sideways, oh, stand sideways. It, so they're kind of back there. So 
but they're, they're, they're pretty easy to manage, but they, they help in my profession a lot. It's a desirable thing, so, and it makes it easy to lean on counters, yeah? So, yeah. <laughs> and relieve yourself. Sometimes you have to hold your own knees up in first position. Um, but that's kind of what I realized all of a sudden when I started getting scholarships to dance camps around the nation that uh, everything in school that I would, was made fun of of being really thin, I was like a half a person. It took a long time till I popped out to be a real size person. And the shape of my legs and going to ballet and not doing after school activities, but doing these things and dancing in every talent show I possibly could, traveling to Seattle and Boston and around for, for, my, for my art kind of left also not too many friends to be able to so I didn't have anybody to eat with during lunch. But lunchtime, I was normally in the playground doing any kind of ballet or dancing anyway. So it kind of served itself. But it led to a great profession because all of a sudden, I realized that I had something special and that it didn't have to be schoolwork. It didn't have to be like my brothers and sisters. I didn't have to be the smartest person to bring home A's on my report card. Um, but I could, I could bring home these things that helped me excel. And I didn't know what it was like to be a professional dancer. So when I arrived to Pacific Northwest Ballet, I did Blue Flower. Oh, Blue Flower has... In what? In, in the Nutcracker. My first p uh, professional performance was in the Nutcracker on stage with Pacific Northwest Ballet. And Blue Flower has, um, I think, 24 or 38 counts. We run on, we go down, we go vomp, we pat, we do some envoites, we saute and we run off. And I was in the wings for two hours prior to that, standing there, ready to go on. And I was like, this is fantastic. What is everybody else doing? And then I would watch and people are really dancing, doing solos and doing all sorts of things. And the salmon flowers, they get to be on stage the entire time doing everything. Well, I got hired at, um, just before my 18th birthday to PMB and the casting went up for Nutcracker and I was a salmon flower. I was like, I have made it. I am in salmon. I get to stand in front and I get to dance the whole time, which was, Absolutely fantastic. Obviously, I'm here, and my talents got me here. So I don't need class anymore. I don't need to go to very many rehearsals because I'm not going to do Blue Flower. And I, go, I, I really now I'm going to have fun. I'm all by myself in an apartment downtown Seattle at the age of 17, earning my own living, not drawing off funds from my parents so that they can't tell me what to do, and so. What do you think that kind of does to somebody? No guidance, no anything else. So I got a little into trouble, just... In the, in, in, is the song, in the Nirvana days, right? In the Nirvana uh, days, on yeah. Ca Kurt, on on yeah. Capitol Hill, Kurt Co getting Kurt, into trouble. Kurt Cobain was part of my, my group, and my age group, and uh, a part of the people that I kind of hung out with. So, and um, yes, it was 21, but if you went to the back door, you could kind of get in. If you never go to the bar, you don't get kicked out. You just dance the whole time. So my schedule was a little different than most dancers who were dedicated to the industry. And that was that uh, you go to bed at 10, and you get up and you go to class at, t at 10, and you work until 7. Mine was more like I worked till 7, I went home, I took a nap, I went out at 10, and then I came back and took a nap until rehearsal at noon. So that, uh, not so much dedication. So I was fired, as we call it. I was not re-engaged. So dancers have a one-season contract. At the end of that, that uh, my first company year, I wasn't re-engaged. I was told I had too much talent and I didn't know what to do with it and they couldn't handle it anymore, uh, which is kind of shocking. All of a sudden, everything crashed. That My father was like, you're going to go to college now. Oh, my God, my worst nightmare in the entire world. And that I was going to now have to go home and live under that roof, or what do I do? I was uh, starting to date Michael Lauer at that time, um, who was a principal dancer in the company. And, you know, I think I'll wake up, I think I'll go dancing. He's like, mm, I think we'll sleep and go to class tomorrow. All of a sudden, my focus changed completely. C 
class, dedication. I became a technique junkie. So technique is, is how we do something. So if we do a tondu, exactly where it is, two, one knee in front of the other knee, the toe is in front of the nose, unless you're in an epaulement. Epaulement is all about the upper body. Um, extensions, turnout, rotation from the hips and the knees, not just the feet, so we're not like this, but we're like this. Every single thing as how to do a pirouette, how to do five pirouettes, how to do seven or eight or nine pirouettes, how to jump in an, in an extension split, how to rest in the air when the momentum takes you up that you can be carried across the, the skyline of the stage before coming down. It's a jeté. Yes, that's a jeté. So how do you do this? This, is be, this became my new energy. This became what I dove into. My talents were, were allowing me to do this, and now my new focus also allowed me to do this, which kind of was nice because then I started getting more roles. I also got hired back to the company um, when Joffrey Ballet was talking to me and asking me if I'd like to join the company. Um, as a soloist, my director called and said, you know, I think you've learned your lesson. I think you should come back. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. So since I already have an apartment here, I don't have to move, So, which was fantastic. And it really was the company I wanted to be in. I felt connected to the organization. The organization was growing. Um, Extramentally, taking going on tours, but I also got to travel with them. But my talents traveled with them too. As the company rose and and our profile did, so did mine. Um, that's a picture from Romeo and Juliet after you drink the potion. Something that was difficult for me was um, as reviews started coming out for me because I dove so much into my technique and because of the shape of body I have. And what really kind of thrills me is how many turns I can do or how high I can jump. Um, the drama side of my artistry didn't match my talents at that time. So taking on roles like Romeo and Juliet were things that I really had to, to work on. Watch a lot of films, watch a lot of movies, dive into the soul and the character of that, per that person. So I wasn't considered an ice princess, which I got a few reviews for, which always upset me. And then I just decided it was the way I looked. Thank you, Ferris, Thank for your you, coffee. Ferris. Yeah, I'm going to try to talk faster because I think it's 9:30. But um, all of this, I dressed up every single day. Firebird, again, a bird. Uh, Paquita, uh, Swan Lake was probably the most incredible time that I had. I was dancing opening night Swan Lake. I had already performed it, but on all the matinees. I was like the matinee queen, because every other principal in the company was 10 years older than I am, and then there was me. I was like, wow. And so I got to dance opening night, and Swan Lake, it goes bomb, 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 and the Swan Queen from the wing does glissade jeté and onto stage. And you have to wait four beats, and the conductor goes, Da, da, and you do arabesque and down. And I'm on stage, I jete onto stage, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't hear the conductor. I have to stare at him. Why are they applauding? So much applause. And then I was like, they're applauding because I arrived to, you know, thousands. And then I was like, settle down, just do your arabesque. You have a whole ballet to do. You're going to be tired at the end of the day. And then I was like, that was really cool. So that was, oh my gosh, talk about the energy I had for the audience. And they saw me on an opening night, not my matinee uh, gray hairs as we called them, that, that, that sat in row uh, P all the way across. Yeah, I have to be careful too. So, um, oh, injuries happen. Midsummer Night's Dream. Injuries happen. It's, it's, uh, it's a walk of the life. So we wrap gold lame on it and we put it behind me you know, uh, to take poster photos. Um, I was very fortunate to work with people such as Marie Sindak and, and have an incredible friendship with him. This is Nutcracker, PMB, uh, that we filmed with MGM. One that looks like a nutcracker.
I, it makes me sweat when I watch myself. Uh, Marie Sendek created the, the Nutcracker for Pacific Northwest ba Ballet back in uh, 80, 84, 84. And we worked on it for quite some time. Maurice was an incredible man. He, if, if you don't remember his name, he's uh, where all the wild things are. And, uh, and, <laughs> and many other things, many things that creates fantasy, especially for children and adults alike. I think when we read them, we can both understand. Dark fantasies. Well, I think he addresses uh, real problems. I remember him sending me a book called uh, Down in the Dump with Jack and Guy. And he said, you know, Patricia, I'm getting a lot of pushback. What do you think of this? What do you think of this book? And I said, it's absolutely incredible. Nobody is addressing children, uh, homeless children, and the fear of children being homeless. And this book does and it opens a dialogue. And I think that's what art does. It continues to open a dialogue. And that's why, why Creative Mornings is here. And that's why we are here creating fantasies for you that we can, we can create dialogue that heals us and that uh, catapults us to the next imagination. Ferris, no, no, no. thank you very much. So, it's Microsoft. Uh, uh, but Maurice was a huge part of my life uh, up until his, his death just a couple years ago. In fact, I talked to him um, the weekend before he, he died, which was very, very difficult. But it also inspired me to create works for our own organization, such as the Nutcracker that we have here with Chris Van Allsburg. Chris is in our own backyard, and he's a part of our, our fiber and our community. And so to go to him was a natural natural path for me because I because I had already experienced this and I and I knew that it would um, bring great results I was very fortunate um, to also be Titania in a Midsummer Night's Dream we filmed it with uh, BBC um, the in London at the opening of Saddler's Wells. They closed Saddler's Wells for a, a little bit, redid the whole thing and opened it up. The strangest thing about the filming was the audience was lit like you guys are. And so I'm used to a, a little wall there. So I was like, oh, look at there's people. They're staring. They're looking. And then the, our, our, they filmed it over four performances. Our, our director was down in the film picking films. And she's like, you missed that Airbus. That one's on three. This is going in for posterity for the rest of the, the forever. So you have to make that arabesque on three. So you do the whole next performance like, oh my God, oh, three, three, where's three? There's three. I hit it. I hit it. And she'd be like, but you missed five, six, and seven of the, you're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't handle this. Uh, there's Swan Lake. So that's with Stanko Milov. He's a uh, Bulgarian and he was six, seven. We would go to a grocery store and girls would be like, oh, do you play basketball? Like, oh, and he would be like, no, I am classical ballet dancer. And I'd be like, you just didn't get a date. Yeah. <laughs> no. We are very fortunate. I mentioned London. We uh, toured to China, Istanbul, yeah, uh, Hong Kong, um, Edinburgh Festival, and Scotland. Uh, I was in Denmark. I'm looking at all the other things. I danced with New York City Ballet, Boston Ballet, Pittsburgh Ballet, the Royal Danish as a guest artist. So. When I was seven and I started dancing, I sure couldn't think of all of this that would happen. So we create fantasy constantly from the stage to our audience. Um, and the reality that I have now, not being that person, but being the artistic director and leading an organization, reality's come in a $2.6 million budget, 34 dancers. 70 employees all together that we employ from stagehands to everything else, school teachers, pianists to play for our classes, uh, 500 subscribers, Chris Van Allsburg. How do you get to Chris? How do you get his phone number? He's not like in the phone book. We, everybody said they knew him. Everybody. Our executive director, Glenn Del Vecchio, every single time, I'm like, get the phone number, get the phone number. He's like, everybody knows him, nobody has the phone number. So he, we're... He finally, he was very persistent, and we're very thankful for that. Um, Louis Grane, um, anybody know Ratatouille, the movie Ratatouille, uh, the box trolls? Louis Grane created the anim... 
Hotel Transylvania. Hotel he's Transylvania. The principal character uh, animator. Animator for that and uh, for the first one, not the second yeah. one. He doesn't like the second one. Uh, he's well, he's <laughs> not involved. Right? He was like, I wasn't involved. So, it but always goes downhill. <laughs> He's here. He's going to be here uh, working with us on Alice in Wonderland at the end of the season. And as you see, we have a projector. We use the projectors um, often, and we're going to try to create um, a round video so that when Alice goes down that rabbit hole, that the you feel as an audience going down. I want blowers in the back to like fans that go so that you feel the wind. I'm not sure I'll get it. I ask for the moon and I, I sometimes get two dollars. They're like, here's two dollars. You can do it like with this. So uh, so I'm, I'll be back there going <laughs> and I'll run back and forth. So uh, it should be OK. So if you feel hot air on you, that's me. But anyway, so that's oh, anyway, that's so Alice. That's Alice. So yeah. keep me on track. I, uh, it's not worked so far. I, I, yeah, I know. You haven't helped very much. You're, you're not giving me a chance. Oh, okay. <laughs> Married 33 years, people. So, uh, and yes, he's always carried my bags and, and things like that, make sure I get to where I need to go. And I was very fortunate. And I do the cooking, too. Oh, he cooks, too, because otherwise I would be hungry. Oh my goodness, yeah. That my biggest fear of going on stage is being hungry. So I always had a bag of Skittles with me wherever I went. They're fruity and they make your breath smell good and you feel like, like that sugar is, is instant. It's even better than caffeine almost. Uh, Move Media is a, is a series of performances that we created because women have little voice as choreographers in our industry. People are always saying, where are the women? I'm a woman director, which is also very rare. Um, but I have a great support team. And a uh, big, big part of that support team is not only Michael and, and Glenn, but it's the staff, but it's those dancers. It's those dancers that get upstage on here every, every time we perform. Some of you, th I had an incredible career. I had an uh, incredible fantasy of life. And I still feel I'm, li I'm living it because I'm a living artist. This is not what I do in my part time. This is not my after school activity. I put it in quotations. Um, when people ask my dancers, so what do you really do for a living? So this must be your hobby. No, this is what they do for a living. They start at 9.30 in the morning, they finish at 7 on rehearsal days, and they start at 10, and they finish at 10 on performance weeks. This is what they do. They're living, working, breathing artists. That's absolutely incredible. And it's for the ones that are lucky. And it is luck sometimes being at the right place, having the right talents, and, and knowing how to apply yourself. It was very fortunate when I was fired that I had somebody to guide me back into being something, because otherwise I wouldn't be here providing as much of the career that I had, where I got to travel and what I got to do for my own dancers and the next generation. Imagination is, um, I think, key to any artist from architecture to, to, to numbers to, you can put it anywhere. But it is that imagination of what we can do and where we can go. Michael and I are both from Seattle. Well, he's actually from Austria via Seattle. Um, and we're so used to the entrepreneurship of there is that you don't have coffee, you don't have dinner, we don't talk about one thing where somebody doesn't have three companies that they started yesterday. And they're thinking of being involved in another one here. And all of that energy is you guys right now in this community. So. Um, Move Media is one of those things that we took on here at Grand Rapids Ballet to create a voice for choreographers, not emerging choreographers, not getting your first time, not established choreographers that are working in every single major ballet company, but those choreographers that are working people like you and I, that go into the studio every day, that they already have a voice and they're already creating things. And that's what Move Media does. And I have to say we've created, I think, a little over 50 pieces in the last five years that it's been in existence, and half of those, or maybe even a little bit more, are by women choreographers. I'm very proud of that, so. Well, are we done? I think, do you have anything else? I do. Oh, oh, Q&A. And there's some videos we didn't show because I didn't have enough time, I didn't in fact talk fine enough. So, any questions? <laughs>